How many people have seen the movie Braveheart? Yeah. All right. Freedom! I mean, come on, you can't, you can't. I was William Wallace when that movie came out. I was just like walking around in a kilt. No, I wasn't. But anyways, um, my wife would let me out of the house. No, but there's a line in that movie. And if you guys have seen the movie, you'll know the scene. It's where they're all lined up on their horses and, and the British soldiers are, are on the other side of that field and he's all painted up and he's on his horse and he's riding back and forth. And he's, he's, and I am not going to try to do the Scottish accent. I practiced for a couple of hours. It just wouldn't, wouldn't work. So I'll spare you from that. But he's riding back and forth and he's kind of, he's just, he's stoking up his, 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 uh, his countrymen to go against the British, right? And they're like, oh yeah, but if we, if, if, if we run away, we'll live for a while, right? And there comes that famous, that famous line that he says, he says, you know, they may take away your life, but they'll never take away your freedom. You guys remember that? Well, I want to tell you today that, you know what, sometimes if we truly want to live our lives in Christ, we must be willing to give up our freedoms. We must be willing to give up our rights in order to see what God has for us and God has for somebody else. If you look at Corinthians chapter 8, what Paul was talking about there is he gave the example of the weaker brethren, the weaker in the faith, the less mature than they have this problem with meat being sacrificed to idols and then eating it. Some of the people who are maybe more mature in their faith or stronger in their faith or didn't come out of that pagan lifestyle said, you know what, what's the big deal? We eat, food goes in, it comes out, it has no effect on us. There's only one true God, the living God, whom we serve and whom we know, right? They're like, yeah, but still, if you're going to stumble your brother by eating meat sacrificed to idols, it would be better that you don't do that. And what Paul was saying is that it is better to live under the law of love than under that law of right and wrong. And that at times, guess what? We have to give up our perceived rights in order to prefer somebody else. And so in chapter 8, he gives that illustration. We talked a little bit about that in um, the example of, do I have the freedom to to have a drink? By all means, I do. But as a pastor at One Love, I'm seen at uh, at a restaurant having a glass of wine or having a beer. And somebody who is a little bit less mature in their faith or a new believer comes in and maybe they've struggled with alcohol in the past. Well, hey. Pastor Larson, he's all tattooed up anyways. He's got drinking a beer. I'm going to go have a beer. And I could stumble him walking in my freedom. In fact, I know of a story. Years ago, there was a, uh, a missions team that went out. And they had a great missions trip. God moved. People got saved. And on the way back, the, the leader of this missions trip thought it would be nice to just buy everybody just a drink, a beer. International flight. Everybody was of age. It was totally legal. They were totally had the freedom to do that. But what he didn't realize is that one of the members on his team had struggled with alcoholism in his past. And by having the freedom to just say, hey, you know, have a drink on me. It's just one. No big deal. Woohoo. Go God or whatever it was. That person stumbled and fell back into struggling with alcohol. Now, thanks be to God that he is, you know, that worked out. He doesn't struggle with that anymore. It all worked out. But again, it's not like this leader was a bad person. He didn't have bad intentions. He just didn't use his wisdom. He didn't prefer somebody who might be a little bit weaker and less mature in their faith that couldn't handle something like that. And what Paul is saying in chapter 8 is we need to look out for one another, especially those in the body of Christ. Prefer them. Live by the law of love. What does Paul say in chapter 8, verse 1? That love does what? Love edifies. It builds up. Corinthians 16, 14 says, let all that you do be done in love. And Paul really puts, a, I think, an exclamation point on it. If you look at chapter 8, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 12, and this is Paul's perspective. He says this, But if you sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? When you sin against them, you sin against Christ. If you've done this for the least of these, you've done them for me, Jesus. There's a connection there. We need to walk and love and prefer one another. So that's kind of the, the wrap up of chapter 8. And as we look at chapter 9, Paul is going to give us an illustration of what it is to live in love, in giving up our rights for the sake of others. He's going to use himself, a mature Christian believer, and he's going to give the example of why he decided to not hold on to his rights. And we're going to see that some people think that chapter 8 is kind of a parenthesis or an interruption between chapters 8 and 10. But what it is, it is an illustration of those principles talked out in chapter 8 and chapter 10. And Paul, is, again, I love that Paul does this. He uses himself as an example all the time. I love as you go through the letters of the New Testament. He says, if you want to know how to live, look at my life. I will show you Jesus. 
by the actions and by my words. I think that's a call for all of us to step up and to know Jesus more intimately. Amen? All right, so what we're going to see here is Paul giving his personal example, and he's going to lay out six logical reasons. Another thing, I'm a little bit, if you haven't noticed yet, a tad scattered at times, a little spastic in, in moments, and sometimes I have a hard time kind of grasping onto logical things. But with Paul, if you read any of his letters, he is a very logical thinker, and he speaks in very logical ways. And what we're going to see in chapter 9 here is he lays out six logical reasons of why he has the right to receive money for his ministry in Corinth. Why, as a minister of the gospel, he should be paid for it. But then what he does is he goes and he says, I'm going to tell you then why I chose to give up this right. And what we're going to see, what I hope we're going to see, is that lying at the heart of Paul's calling and his commission as an apostle is the reason he would gladly give up any right. And I think as we see that, we are going to see what God is calling us to do in our calling and in our commission and how we are to give up and why we're to give up our rights. Let's pray. Father God, again, we come to you and we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active, that it comes into us and it just changes us. God, I pray that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds, and open up our eyes to see what you have for us today. Holy Spirit, I pray that it would be you speaking today and not me. God, we want to become more like you. We want to know you in a more intimate way, Jesus. We want to feel your love, feel your presence. We want to know who you are, God. We want to know the plans that you have for us. Because they are so great and so awesome. And we cannot even imagine the love that you have for us, God. If there's anything in us that would keep us from hearing your word today, help us to put it aside. Search our hearts and know us, Lord God. Prepare us for what you have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so getting into chapter 9, verse 1. Look at the first two verses here. Paul says this. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So basically what Paul is saying here in his first defense, in his first, defense, in his first logical argument, is that he is an apostle. Now some in Corinth, just as some in Galatians, uh, Galatia, were questioning whether or not Paul was actually an apostle. Did he have the authority? So he says, you know what? I am an apostle. In fact, we have uh, the definition of the word apostle is one who is sent under a commission. Now, this more specifically in, refers to the 12 apostles that Jesus called to himself and then sent out. We see that in the Gospels. You guys following? And it also refers to Paul. Because if we look at Acts chapter 9, we, we see that Paul saw the risen Christ, the resurrected Christ. And that was one of the requirements to be called an apostle, was seeing the, 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 uh, Jesus in his resurrected form. So what I want you guys to do is flip over to Acts chapter 9. And I want to just read through the first eight verses there and just look at Paul's conversion experience on the road to Damascus. And the reason I want to take a little bit of time here is because I know this is probably uh, a story that we've heard at some point. But this is very crucial into why Paul, I think, is willing to give up those rights. He's not just defending himself as an apostle here, but this plays into his calling and his mission and his commission to go. So we're at Acts chapter 9, and you'll look at the first eight verses. <clears throat> now pay attention to, to just how the word describes Paul. And you can just picture him as probably not a really nice guy. Okay? I think he's a little aggro here. He seems just a little angry. Paul needs a hug, I think. He kind of gets one in a hard way here. We'll see. All right, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, again, Paul does not discriminate, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Verse 3, and it came about that as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and it shall be told you what you must do. And then the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. So we can see that this seems like 
a slightly significant event in Paul's life. He saw the risen Lord, and that was one of the requirements to be called an apostle, to see the risen Christ. Now, another uh, qualification was that um, they were to perform signs and miracles by the power of the Lord. And we can see that happening. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, if you want to go back to Corinthians, and uh, chapter 9, I'm just going to read from you verse 2, 4. What does Paul say? Paul says, in my message and my preaching were not in, pers- in persuasive words of wisdom, but in what? In demonstration of the spirit and of the power. Go to Acts chapter 18, when Paul was in Corinth, when he preached the gospel, the things that happened there. We can see in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, that he said, you saw among you the signs of a true apostle. The Holy Spirit moved. His apostleship should not be in question. He fulfills the requirements of what it would be to, call, to be called an original apostle. And he said, but even, even that, He says, look at verse 2, chapter 9, verse 2, Corinthians, if to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal or the sign of my apostleship in the Lord. He says, anybody questions whether or not I've been doing the work of God? Anybody questions the fact of whether or not I have been sent by the Lord to preach the gospel? All they have to do is look at you, Church of Corinth. You are the fruit of my labors. What does Luke 6 tell us? The good tree bears good fruit. And we can see that there is good fruit in Corinth. That there is a church that has been planted, that has been established. They got a little issues, but hey, who here doesn't have issues, right? And so he says, if anybody questions whether or not I'm doing the work of the Lord, questions my apostleship, look at you, church of Corinth. You are my sign and my seal of my apostleships. So now, let's get into verses, uh, chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. And I want you to follow again Paul's logic. And what he's going to do is he's going to use these rhetorical questions to engage his readers, his listeners, into following his uh, arguments here. And he's going to lay out these arguments. And if you look at chapter 9, you'll see, I think, in the entire chapter, the, the word right, as in I have the right to or the freedom to, is used six times. In just the 18 verses that we're looking at this morning, it is used five times. Paul is really focusing them on and what he has the right to do. And he uses this rhetorical question to engage their thinking. And he kind of uses that, I don't know, it's called rhetorical, but, you know, it's that negative, positive, weird, it's an English thing, I'm not an English major. But he says, you know, do I not have the right to, which means I have the right to. You follow me? You follow me? Okay. Thank you. Just making sure you're still there. Okay. So he's going to go through, use these uh, arguments of logic to let his readers know exactly where he's coming from. So let's look at verses uh, 3 through 6. Now, my defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? That's Peter. Verse 6, or do only Barnabas and I not have the right, not have a right to refrain from working? Paul gives the examples of the other apostles. They have the right to food and drink. They have been provided for as they preach the gospel. Now he says, do I have the right to eat and drink? What he's talking about is, do I not have the right as I minister the gospel to have my needs taken care of? Do I not gain my living from preaching the gospel? That is nothing or not too much to ask. That, that verse that says to take along a believing wife basically says that, look at the, the, you know, the stepbrothers of the Lord. As they went out, they were married, their wives accompanied them. Peter, who was singled out in the beginning of 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, remember those kind of those divisions in the church? I am of Paul, I am of Paul, so I am of Peter. Well, hey, I am of Jesus, you know, that whole thing. He singles out Peter and says, look at Peter, he's married. You can see him bringing his wife along as he preaches the gospel and he ministers. Do I not have that right also? Now, we know from chapter 7, I believe, that Paul gave up that right to even be married. He wanted to remain unmarried so that his sole focus and sole devotion could be on preaching and teaching the gospel. Nothing would distract him from preaching the gospel. And when you got a wife as beautiful as mine, it's sometimes hard to take your eyes off her and do what needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's funny because it's true. So he wanted to be fully devoted to serving God. And he said, if I... He goes, I have the right to be married, but I chose not. I even gave up that right. But if I were married, I have the right to bring along a believing wife for them to be cared for, for us to minister the gospel together. So his first reason is his apostleship, looking at 
what an apostle is, and looking at how the other apostles as they minister are provided for as well. His second reason is just look at life experience. Look at what happens around us. And he gives us three great examples that would be very vivid images from those surrounding him. And I think we can relate to them as well. If we look at verse 7, it says this. Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard or does not eat the fruit of it? Who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? Now, we have a lot of people who are in the military here. <clears throat> and uh, I was looking up online, like, let's say you're the commander of a naval fleet. Are they going to make you buy the ships before you command them? A few billion dollars so that you can do... No, they're going to provide that for you. I believe that they put the gun in your hands, the, 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 uh, the uh, what do you call that, uniform on you, the boots on your feet, they put food in your stomach, and they send you out, right? The military... If you're a soldier, as you enlist, you realize that certain needs are going to be taken care of so that you can focus on what they want you to do. That makes sense, right? What about somebody who's planting a vineyard? The farmer who tills the soil, who plants the seed, who nurtures those crops to see that fruit come. Is it not logical that he could eat of the fruit that he gets or drink of the fruit of the vine? Yes, it provides for him in many different ways. And what about the shepherd who's tending the flock? as he loves that flock, as he makes sure they're okay, is his family not going to be fed on the milk that comes from that flock? Yes, of course it is. We just look at life experience around us and we can see that as you sow, as you pour into something, as you work, naturally things come back to you. It's kind of like, duh, it's common sense. It's logical that this would happen. And since Paul has been laboring amongst the church and the people in Corinth, should he not enjoy the fruits of his labor. Paul is saying, yes, I should. And I like the images that he, that he uses there. The soldier, the, the, the farmer, <clears throat> and the, the shepherd. Because I think that, I mean, we can see throughout scripture, Jesus using some of these, these, these examples as well. There's just great spiritual principles that we see there. You know, as a soldier, as you're enlisted, to, as you serve the one who has enlisted you, your sole focus is to do what they tell you to do. Was Paul not a soldier for the Lord? Did he not have a goal and one goal, and that is the goal that he strove for, to know nothing but Christ crucified and to preach his gospel to the ends of the earth? You can see that he was faithful in that service. What about as far as a, a, a farmer? Did not Paul till the soil, plant that seed in Corinth? Did he not come and water that, encouraging them with letters, encouraging them with prayers to see that fruit come as he's looking at it right now? What about tending to the flock? There's an image that just sticks with us. Looking after the flock that is in our charge. Making sure that they're taken care of. Making sure that they're, they're not in want of anything. I think these are images that speak to us on many different levels. We can take them. And I think Paul kind of has this image as he uses these examples. So Paul says, okay, my apostleship is one. Second, life experience. Now the third reason that he's going to give... <clears throat> is that, let's look at the Old Testament law. The Old Testament sets a precedence for us to understand that where you sow, you should reap as well. Let's look at verses 8 and 9. Paul says this, I am not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it is written of, in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? What is Paul talking about? What Paul here is doing is he is quoting from Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. And he actually uses this same illustration in 1 Timothy. If you want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, um, catch me there here. So uh, 1 Timothy, so if you're in Corinthians, go to the right. If you hit Revelation, you've gone too far, go back. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Paul says this. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. Verse 18. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. You shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now, yet the image here is one of, they would have an oxen connected and they bring the grain and he would tread out the grain and he would break it down as you walk kind of in a circle. And it would be kind of cruel as the ox could eat on this, get energy to do his service as he's 
treading out the grain, it'd be kind of cruel to muzzle him so he couldn't eat. It's kind of a cruel thing, right? So the principle is there, that if you're working, you should be able to get from what you're working, what you're laboring for. And Paul sees this Old Testament principle here to be used now. Is the ox going to read Deuteronomy 25.4? I don't think so. He might eat the pages if he sees it, but he's not going to read it. It was not written for the ox. No, it wasn't. Why? Back in Corinthians, you look at chapter, verse 10, he says, Or is he speaking altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, yes, this is written. Because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing in the crops. That hope, as you're pouring into it, is the, the meaning of that word is the absolute expectation of coming good. That what you are pouring into, that what you are working for, will produce fruit. You know it. Your hope is set on that. You are absolutely expecting a coming good for the work that you are doing. So those who plow and those who thresh do it in the hope of what? In receiving the fruit of the labor of their hands, of the work of their hands. All right, let's catch me in verse 11 now. Paul brings this all together in verse 11. He says this. If we have sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we should reap material things from you? And Paul applies here the fact that, like I said before, he spent time, he's tilled the soil in Corinth. He's planted that seed. He's helped bring the gospel there. Is it a big thing that as he has worked and labored there that he should receive his needs taken care of? Again, no. It makes sense. The Old Testament shows us in principle as well. He has the right to enjoy the fruits of the harvest. So we've got his apostleship, life experience, looking at the things around him, and the Old Testament law. Three reasons why he has the right to receive payment for preaching the gospel, why his needs should be taken care of. Now, there's, this one's easy to miss if you, don't, if you don't see it. If you look at verse 12, he kind of sneaks this one in here too. This is the fourth reason. If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endured all things that we may cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. So Paul is saying, you know what? You have supported other people in their teaching here. So right there, you set the precedent that I have a right to receive from you as well. And what we, have to, what we have to understand about this culture is people would go around and there'd be actually traveling teachers, both Christian and non-Christians, that would actually go around and they would teach in different cities and they would expect to be taken care of and expect payment for their teachings. And this is something that has probably happened in Corinth as well. And so Paul said, you've already, you've already set the precedent. You have given money to people who have come and taught. So right there, we have that right as well. If we look at verses uh, 13, we get back into an Old Testament practice. How did God provide for the priests and the Levites as they served at the altar, preparing those sacrifices and setting up the sanctuary? So look at verse 13. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share with the altar. Leviticus chapter 6, I believe in 27, along with Numbers 18, breaks down the, 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 sacrificial, um, the sacrifices and, and how they were to do the sacrifices and the portion that the Lord set aside for the priests serving so that their needs would be taken care of. If you haven't already heard Waxer's teaching on Leviticus, I highly suggest that you go on our website, go online, go to the archive messages and listen through or watch through the Levitical teaching um, because you will be blown away if you have not heard. And you will see Jesus in the book of Leviticus. And as you're on Wednesday nights when Waxer's going through Numbers, you see Jesus in Numbers. And it is amazing how God has set this all up to point to the cross, to point to Jesus, the Messiah, and what he was going to do, and how you see that in the sacrificial system, and how you see God's grace and God's provision for us uh, and for the Israelites there. The priests, as they served day after day, bringing the sacrifices for Israel to the altar, doing that hard work, God set aside a portion of that for them because they deserved to be taken care of. They didn't have time. They were busy ministering to the things of the Lord, to the things uh, of Israel. And he set aside a special portion for them so that they would not go and have any need, that their needs would be taken care of. And so what we see Paul doing is, is as he looks at this, he says, if the people under the law in the Old Testament were provided for, 
from the people that they minister to. Should not the minister who, ministers who minister under grace also be provided for from the people that they minister to? And he's saying, yes, we can see that. The principle is there. Now, as we look at him going from the Old Testament, he goes into a New Testament example now, and he goes from an example from the teaching of Jesus himself. And we can see that as Jesus called his disciples to them to send them out, <clears throat> that he said a laborer is worthy of his wages. Back in Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14, chapter 9 says, So also the Lord. So he goes from an Old Testament example to a New Testament example here, looking at Jesus' teaching. Verse 14, chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. We look at Matthew 10.10. 10. Don't need to turn there. Um, look at Math, Matthew 10.10. 10. Jesus says that, oh, I know that this is, if you want to check on me, go ahead, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> Matthew 10.10, 10, uh, Jesus said that a, worky, a, a worker is worthy of his food. Luke 10.7 says, remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give you, for the laborer is worthy of their wages. As Jesus called his disciples to them and sent them out to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He gave them power and authority over unclean spirits to proclaim that good news, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. And we see that they did this in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said, your task is one where you need to be focused on what I've called you to do. So you're going to travel light. You're not going to take all this extra stuff. God is going to provide for you because where God guides, he... That's right. And we see that with these apostles as they go out. He says, when you enter a house and they receive the word, you're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to remain with them as long as you can, and they're going to provide for you. God's provision as we go to do his work. So even in the Lord's teaching, he understood that as he sends his people out to teach and preach, to minister to people, that their needs will be taken care of by those whom he ministers to. Now, unfortunately, we live in a, a, in a day where this has been abused to the umpteenth degree. We all know the, yeah, yes, come on, get on your knees. I'm going to pray for you with my big hey. I'm Jesus going to give you that Mercedes Benz, you know. We, we see these abuses. Where, um, we, we see these abuses where people are on TV and they, they just want our money. And what message does that send? You know, this ministry is going down unless you send me 1995 right now in three installments, you know. I'll give you this great prayer shawl. It's like a piece of paper. I never sent in for it. I'm, I just know about this stuff, okay. Um, <clears throat> And you have all these tricks and gimmicks. And what message does that send to people out there? We're not caring about you. I just want your money. I just want to lie in my pockets. Is that the message that we want attached to the gospel? No. There's this line in the, uh, the musical group, uh, U2, which I'm probably sure most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with. And um, the song Silver and Gold. And there's this line where uh, Bono, the lead singer of U2, says, talking about these people who are ripping off the, the old and the sick, trying to get their money. He says, well, the God I believe in isn't short of cash, mister. Amen. And that's what I love. One thing about One Love is, you know, we're not going to pass the offering plate. There's nothing wrong with that in churches that do that. I belonged and worked and ministered in churches that do that. But you're going to notice the offering boxes along the side. Because you know what? That's between you and God. If you're coming here and you're getting fed, guess what? God's going to move in your heart to give. And that's what it needs to be about. It's not about making sure. I've been in, I remember one of the first church experiences I have after I got saved. I went to a church, and they had like no less than three times where the, pay, the plate was passed. That's what I remember from that service. I have no idea what the pastor preached. I have no idea what the message of that they're talking about. I just remember that all they did was continually pass the plate, pass the plate. And it wasn't for like for missionaries or for this or for that. It was for themselves. Now, again, I'm not saying these are bad people. I'm not judging them. What I'm saying is that it's a little misguided. And I do not want to represent our Lord and Savior and saying, well, you know, you need to give me money. I will happily serve God. God has called us to minister here. God has called you to minister somewhere. And guess what? He will provide for you as you go along the way. Amen? All right. We can see that principle actually um, set forth in Matthew 6 where he says, don't be anxious for what you're going to eat. For what you're going to wear. Does not he clothe the birds, the lilies of the field? Don't be anxious because God is going to provide for you where he takes you. My wife and I have seen that provision uh, abundantly when we were working with YWAM. When every time we would have another kid, we would have, we probably should have stopped having kids, but um, <laughs> we're making disciples. Um, so we're, 
you know, every time we would, every time we would, um, we, we'd have a kid, obviously our, you know, diapers are so much, and, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not earthy, I ain't going to wash it myself, sorry, I'm loving the huggies, boop, throw them away. Um, you know, uh, we'd have a need, but you know what, God would provide. He wouldn't just like drop cash in a lap, <laughs> although that would have been nice. He wouldn't just drop cash in a lap. I would get a job. I'd be able to go to Maui and teach at a YWAM base there and he'd give me an honorarium. Or I'd be able to speak at a church here. Or I'd get a job, be able to roof a house or side a house or um, go clean up somebody's garbage or go help clean up somebody's pool house or yard or whatever it would be. And he'd provide ways for me to still do the work that he called me to in YWAM and still work with my hands to provide uh, stuff. Not just stuff, like we're buying iPods, but, you know, food and clothes for my kids, diapers for them, things like that. And we've seen God's faithfulness in that. Um, I do have a, a cool story I want to share. If I may, and I, I hope I haven't told this one before, but uh, you'll listen anyways, right? Because you're nice. Um, uh, when we were leaving YWAM, we had like $3,500 debt or something like that. It was a little bit, a little bit much. And I had been teaching in this DTS school and... Um, uh, here in, in, in Manoa, and uh, we're speaking of the nature and character of God. And uh, somehow, and I don't know how this worked out, but I'm usually oblivious to most things that, that are going on, um, we got invited to dinner with one of the students' parents. He took all of their outreach team out for dinner before they left for outreach, and we somehow tagged along and were eating dinner there. We had this huge need in this, and we had already gotten the job in Minnesota, so we were transitioning out, getting ready to go be a youth pastor in Minnesota, handing over the ministry uh, in uh, YWAM, this biblical study school we were doing, um, uh, training up those leaders, and we're just kind of in limbo. We're like, we've been thinking, hoping, and praying. We're like, I have no idea how we're going to pay off this debt. No idea. And so we're sitting at dinner with this family, and pretty soon everybody kind of gets up, and they're talking or whatever, and the guy, uh, big guy, yes, I know it's relative, but big guy, at least 5'11". Um, <laughs> leans over to me. No, he's like 6'2". Leans over to me and he goes, um, hey, so what are you guys doing in Minnesota? I'm like, oh, you know, we're going to go and be a youth pastor and, you know, my, my background's in missions and teaching the word and so I just want to get these guys stoked on, on the word. I want to get them out doing missions and stuff like that. And um, his, his son had shared with him some of the things that I had taught. Um, and he just goes, he goes, man, that's awesome. He goes, it's great to see a young family willing to just step out in faith and serve the Lord. He goes, what are your guys' needs? And I was like, now, I don't know this guy from Adam, but I felt like, you know, it's okay to share with him. I said, well, we got, like, I think, like $2,000 debt we got to pay off. Stands me up, walks me over to the, uh, the, the front of the, of the restaurant we were in, and he goes, what was that debt? I said, like, probably like around two grand, I think, you know. So I'm like $1,500 off. That plays in here in a second. Uh, and he goes, hands me his business card. He goes, why don't you go ahead and email me that amount it's taken care of. And I'm like, <laughs> he was a tall guy. I don't know what to say. He says, say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And we go, we sit down. And I was like, and so I'm sitting like this. And he's like, I've got to talk to you when we leave. <laughs> oh, I could not believe this. So then I talked to Karine. She's like, that's great, Aaron, but it's like 3500 I'm like, oh, nuts. I did it again. I've got to pay more attention. And I felt like the Lord said this. I felt like the Lord said, I want you to be honest with them and email them what you really owe. Because this guy was hearing from the Lord too. I'm like, uh, and I wrestled with God with this. And they had left and I emailed and said, you know, thank you so much for your help. Um, <laughs> it's more like 3500 And he, he said, check is in the mail. And he covered us. And I was like, are you kidding? It, the way God provided as he guided where we went was amazing. And there's been stories like that that we're blessed by. And we hope to you know, bless you guys by in, in sharing that, that God will provide for your needs as you do and go where he calls you to go. You know? um, so God is good. Yeah, go God. So here we see Jesus, or no, Paul rather. Um, we see Jesus in Paul. Laying out six logical reasons why he had the right to receive payment and have his needs cared for as he did the work of the ministry. And we see that he comes to the point and he says, you know what? But I want to tell you why I refuse that here in Corinth. We know that other churches had supported Paul as well. We also know that Paul was a tent maker, that he had a trade. He worked in leather. He was able to do that. He did that with Priscilla and Aquila while in Corinth as well. And he says, you know what? I want to tell you why I'm going to refuse that right. And this is what he says. 
He, he, look at verse 15. He says, But I have used none of these things, and I am not writing these, these things that it may be done so in my case. He doesn't want anybody to think that, oh, hey, you know, I have all this right to get money, but I'm not going to take it. But really, I'm hoping now that you'll offer it. He's not doing that double-handed thing. He's not being dishonest or manipulative in any way. And what he's saying is this. He's saying, I am not writing these things for that. It may be done so in my case, for it would be better for me to die than to have any man make my boast an empty one. Paul's focus is on preaching the gospel. He is illustrating the point that sometimes, for the sake of love, we need to give up our rights so that the gospel can go forth. That is Paul's calling, that is his commission, and that what he is so focused on, that is he is willing to endure inconveniences for the sake of the kingdom of God. Sometimes we hear, and sometimes I've been in this position as well, where we're like, you know, the things I do for this church. And they just knew how much time I spent. I wake up at 6.30 in the morning so I can get here to do this. Are you serving a church or are you serving God? Because we should be serving God. Amen? And if your focus is on man and your focus is on serving people, you will be disappointed every single time. If I was to walk into this ministry and say, okay, I want to make sure that, now picture Waxer here, I want to make sure that I'm making sure that I'm serving Waxer, I will be frustrated and I will be yelled at a lot because I'm not serving Waxer. If I look at you guys and go, yeah, I'm serving you, 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 I'm serving you. you." No, I will be frustrated. You will be frustrated. I will fall short. You will fall short. But if I step back, And I say, with the perspective that God can give me, that I am serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he has called me to serve here, then guess what? God is going to move. I'm not going to hinder him. I will be able to lay aside my rights to get up early. uh, Or to not get up early. I will be able to lay aside my rights and my freedoms that will hinder me from serving the gospel. Because as I look at the cross, that is how I need to see you guys. Because Jesus Christ is not just a mediator between God and man. Jesus Christ is a mediator between man and man. We need to see Jesus in every single one of us. And we need to have our focus on what God has called us to do and that we are serving his ultimate goal. And as we do that, we will be able to better love one another and serve one another in the giftings that God has given us and called us to do. Another story for you. Um, and I don't look good in this one again as well. I'll, I, eventually I have some stories where I did something right, but hopefully you can learn from my mistakes. When God first called me uh, to be the leader of this biblical study school in Youth with a Mission it's up in Manoa Valley, um, I had zero experience, but God spoke to me. He confirmed his call in my life, and he said, okay, you're going to do this. So I was pretty stoked. I'm like, God, God's going to use me. It's like, you know, give him a little, yay, dance. God's going to use me. That's what I do. And so as I'm doing that, um, God is kind of building up in me the confidence that I just need to trust in the people he's bringing around me, that it's going to be his call going forth, and I can do this, and it's not me, it's him. Okay, great to trust in the Lord. And so then, you know, you may have noticed too, I'm a little high-strung at times as well. And so I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little um, uh, kind of stressed out uh, as this school approaches, because I've never done this before. I have no idea really what I'm doing. And um, I have all this stuff that I'm trying to figure out what to do. And so then all of a sudden, our, the base director at that time says, we're going to have a base cleaning day. So I need everybody to drop everything that you're doing. We're going to help get the base prepared. This is the YWAM base. The campus prepared for the new school that's coming in. And you know what job I got? The newly appointed leader of the School of Biblical Studies core course in YWAM Honolulu. I got to clean out garbage cans. Now, if you don't know anything about community living... The garbage cans are like the dirtiest part of community living, okay? They're not, you know, we had these big, like, million-gallon drum cans that people would wait till I got this high before they threw stuff away because you could, you know, as long as, you know, it's, it's the rule of it. If you can put it on there, it doesn't fall down, the next person can put it away. <laughs> Those of you in college right now know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? And so... There's, and literally, there's maggots all over it. It doesn't smell nice. It's gross. And so my job was to take all 15 garbage cans from around the, around the base, bring them together, throw the garbage away, and then scrub them out. And this is what, this is what, 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 what went through my head. I was like, but God, you've called me to be the leader of the SBS core course in Honolulu, Hawaii, and youth of the mission. <laughs> to bring your word. Teach people how to study your word. And he was just like, if you cannot scrub that garbage can... You have no right to teach my word. I was like, oh, that one stung. But he was right. And he taught me that lesson. 
And unfortunately, I didn't get that lesson learned until after I'd scrubbed that last maggot-filled garbage can out. And I just went, why, God? And he goes this. I went, ooh. If told me that 12 garbage cans ago, it would have went better. But God is teaching me. We need to be able to give up whatever perceived rights we have to serve other people. Because that shows how mature we are in the Lord. Are we willing to step out and do that even when it is not easy? And Paul shows his maturity and his trust in the Lord by doing that. In fact, he says, don't even think that I want money. I would rather die than somebody thinks that I'm making a buck off the gospel. I would do anything to not hinder the gospel of Christ. Now, in verse 15 through 17, we read this. Uh, Verse 16, for I preach the gospel, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. I am under compulsion, for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel, for I do not, for I, if, oh Lord, if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward, but if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. The temptation is you look at Paul saying, you know what, I I have the right to get money, to be taken care of, but I'm going to refuse that right for the sake of the gospel. The temptation is to say, Man, Paul, you're awesome. What a great, what a, what a great guy. And he says, I don't want you to boast in me because that's not what I'm looking for. In fact, he says, what is his boast? What is his reward? Verse 18, what is then my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. King James and New King James says, so that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. Paul has nothing to boast about. He preaches Out of necessity, out of compulsion, it says in verse 16. Paul said in Romans 1.14 that he was a debtor to both Jews and Greeks. It was his duty to preach the gospel. Jeremiah, what did Jeremiah say? He didn't get a really great response from his preaching, did he? The prophet Jeremiah. He's tried to stop preaching, but what did he say? Could not hold it in because it was like a fire in my bones. Are we that stoked on Jesus that his word as it is in us It is like a fire in our bones that we cannot help but proclaim the gospel. And again, I don't mean just standing up on a street corner and yelling at people. But I mean, do we have the fire in our bones to let people know that Jesus loves them? Do we love them enough to let know that God sent his only son to die for them on a cross? To bring them into that relationship with God. To have that eternal life. To be the person that God has created them to be that they cannot be until they know who Jesus Christ is. Is that what is on the forefront of our hearts and minds? Do we do that? Do we serve people with that passion? Do we worship God with that fire in our bones? We need to be stoked on the Lord. We need to stoke that fire that God has put in us and to be there. That's how Paul felt. And that's why I wanted to look at the road to Damascus. Because you have to think about where was Paul at when God called him, when Jesus met him? He was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He had already consented to the death of Stephen. He was so zealous for God that he was willing to put men and women into jail, into prison, and have them killed because they were coming against the one true God. And in that low point of Paul's life, God stepped in. Jesus stepped in and turned his life around. That is the effect that the love of Christ has on somebody. It takes somebody who's willing to persecute and murder people to be turned around and then proclaim that love to the same people he wanted to put in jail. That is the impact that Jesus had on Paul's life. And that is why he will give up any rights that he has to make sure that that gospel goes out unhindered. It costs a lot for us to know the freedom and to have those rights. It costs Jesus Christ his life. Paul was a part of taking the lives and imprisoning others. And he turned, he wanted to make sure that he could proclaim that truly and not just talk about it, but show people that love as well. The one who tore down the church was now the one who helped lay the foundation for the New Testament church. Paul says, even if I wasn't willing, and I'm sure that there's time in Paul's life as we think about him in the book of Acts where he was not willing. Again, I I remember the story where he was dragged outside the city. He was stoned, left for dead, all beat up. He gets up and what does he do? Game over, man. Time out. I need a break. No, he goes on to the next city and he preaches the gospel. I'm thinking that he maybe didn't feel like still ministering to people after that. 
after being beaten with rods, maybe drifting a night and a day at sea. You may not feel like ministering after that. But he could not help because God had called him to it. He had set that in front of him and he was running towards that goal his entire life. I actually met uh, this the other day at surf clinic, yesterday at surf clinic, uh, White Plains. I met a, a, an army, uh, well, a military chaplain. I don't know if he's in the army or not. A uh, military chaplain. And um, we were talking and he's just, just into it. I think he's like just a few months into his chaplaincy, kind of getting into it. And we were just kind of talking about, well, you know, how did, how did, how did God call you to this, this ministry? He said, you know, when I was like 13 or 14, he says, my pastor looked at me and said, you're going to be a pastor. And he goes, no, I'm not. He said, I did everything I could to run from that calling. But you know what? I couldn't run from it. God called me to it. And God brought me on the path he needed for me to be here now, serving in the military as a chaplain, being trained up to go to war if I need to, and to minister to people in that context. I was like, I have no idea what that would be like. But God has called him to that. He cannot run from it. Because that's what God has created him to do. What is God calling you to today? What is the ministry that he's given you? I've had the opportunity of being here just four months now, I believe. And meeting people and talking and see where you guys are. I see that God has his hand on you guys. And I see that he is working in and through you in many different ways, in many different ministries. It doesn't have to be as a part of one love here and serving and setting up or doing stoic or, or whatever it is. But God is moving in and through you. What is he calling you to do? And are you willing to follow that? And are you willing to give up the rights that you have in order to do what God is calling you to do? To share that gospel with other people. We are not one of the original 12 apostles, but we too have been sent with a mission. And what lies at the heart of Paul's calling and commission is his love for Jesus Christ and his love for people who are lost and dying and don't know the word of God. Don't know who Jesus Christ is. Again, I think about Acts chapter 9 and his commission was to bear the name of Jesus before the Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel. And Jesus even said to Ananias, the man who came and laid hands on Paul to pray for him, he said, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Look at Paul's life. He suffered, didn't he? But he was willing to do it and he would not give up one moment of that. Because he wants people to know who Jesus is. We're called to give up our rights. We're called to follow where God has called us. Our commission with the Great Commission to go out and preach and teach the gospel. Knowing that Jesus is with us every step of the way. That he is guiding and providing. There's a story I want to read you about what it is to, to give up and to sacrifice for the sake of others. Every year in Alaska, there's a thousand-mile dog sled race run for prize money and prestige. And it it commemorates an original race run to save lives. Back in January of 1926, uh, a six-year-old Richard Stanley showed symptoms of diphtheria, signaling the possibility of an outbreak in the small town of Nome. When the boy passed away a day later, Dr. Curtis Welch began immunizing children and adults with an experimental but effective anti-diphtheria serum. But it wasn't long before Dr. Welch's supply ran out. And the nearest serum was in Nanana, Alaska, a thousand miles away in frozen wilderness. Amazingly, a group of trappers and prospectors volunteered to cover the distance with their dog teams. Operating relays from the trading post to trapping station and beyond, one sled started out from Nome, while other sled carrying the serum started out from Nanana. Oblivious to frostbite and fatigue and exhaustion, team masters rushed rather mushed relentlessly until after 144 hours in minus 50 degree winds, the serum was delivered to Nome. And as a result, only one other life was lost to, to the potential epidemic. Their sacrifice, their willingness to give up their rights, saved an entire town so that only one more life was lost. They were willing to give that gift of life and sacrifice their comfort sacrifice their lives for the sake of others. Jesus has given us a sacrifice of his life so that we would know God, so that we would walk in the newness of life, no longer a slave to sin, to the world, or the selfish desires that we have. What he wants is us for to grow in that relationship with him. He wants us to say, yes, 
I will be, as it says in Romans 12, I will present myself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. That we can follow where God has called us, do the things that God has called us to. This is not going to be easy. Letting go of our rights is a difficult thing to do. And guess what? At times it's uncomfortable, at times it's time consuming, and at times it's messy. But are we willing to stand and say, I have the right to this, to that, and to the other thing? if it's going to stumble somebody else? Are we going to hold on to our rights while there's a world out there that is lost and dying and does not know the love of Jesus Christ? God is calling us today to say, I am willing to lay down my rights for those in the body of Christ so that they could mature in their faith. I'm willing to lay down my rights so that people who do not know the love of Jesus would come to know that powerful and saving love. That is the call and the challenge for us today to live out these things in our lives daily so that our God and our Savior could be proclaimed. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word today. Lord Jesus, we thank you that, that you gave up the ultimate sacrifice, that you gave up your life for us. Lord, I just ask that you would... um, if there's something that you're calling us to, Lord, and that we're struggling with, that we don't want to give up a right, we don't want to be inconvenienced for some reason, God, I pray that you'd help us to give us the power to give up that right, God, to look at you. Lord, I ask that if there are people here today that have never experienced that love, Lord, that they're like Paul, they're on the road to Damascus, they're walking away from you, Lord Jesus, I pray that you just open up their hearts and minds to receive you today. Lord God, that they would come to know the love of their God in sending your son Jesus to die for them on a cross. That you rose him again on the third day to everlasting life, God. And that by accepting the gift, just by saying, yes, I believe that you died for my sins. That we can walk in that newness of life that the Bible talks about, Lord Jesus. Lord, as we leave here today, I pray that we'd be more equipped to minister to people. That we'd walk out your love in other people's lives, Lord Jesus.